Welcome to the Life United Podcast. We are all about helping you know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. We know that today's message is going to be a blessing to you. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. See, some of you are churchified. You just sat down automatically. You knew it was time to sit down. (laughs) All right. Praise God. Hey, I want to read you... um, I like to read this just, just because it's fun. Uh, in Luke, uh, I want to read in Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, the story, the account of Jesus being born. And it says in verse 1 of, of Luke chapter 2, it came to pass on, in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place with Quirinius uh, was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up to Galilee and out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Behold, an angel stood before them, and the Lord of glo- uh, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were greatly afraid, and the angel said to them, "Don't be afraid, for hold, I bring you good news, glad tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. <clears throat> for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord." And this will be the sign to you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a, an end, <clears throat> suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Wow. You know, that's a great story. We read read it. We read it to our kids. uh, But it's real. See, that's the thing you've got to hear. It is real. You know, it is not a a story that we tell as a story time about Christmas. It is a reality. And I want to talk to you today, um, and I want to use the shepherd's experience to encourage you today to understand the magnitude of Jesus' birth in the world setting in which he came. See, we get so hooked in on our little world you know, our little piece of the world, you know, just a, just a few hundred years of history even. If you look back, you know, to the beginning of our nation, just not, not much compared to history. And if you're not careful, we create our own little world in our mind uh, about the world and about our place in the world. And what I want you to see today is something a little bit different. First of all, the angel said to them, don't be afraid because I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. Now, see, some people today say, well, I need some good news. Well, I got good news. That's it. Jesus came. That's the good news. Well, I need I need something else. No, you don't. That's all you need. Good news. Great joy. For there is born to you. I like that. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ 
the Lord. Thank God he's born to us. Thank God he's my Savior. Thank God he's the Christ, the Messiah. Now listen to me. And this is what I want you to see today, and hopefully I can get this across to you in our, in our time frame, but I want you to listen, listen to this carefully. The shepherds were nothing special. Now, in a way, they were special because I believe they were the shepherds over the sheep that, that took care of the Passover lambs when they were born. And I talked about this, you know, a little bit last year at Christmas, but I don't want to get into it. So they had, they, there was something special about it. But first of all, they lived in the dark. They lived in the dark. They worked at night. They didn't have street lights. All they had was maybe a little fire that they set around. They couldn't see very far, couldn't see very much. They lived in the dark. Now, in, in the United States, we naturally, we don't know dark because we have street lights. You know, now every once in a while, you can get out somewhere. I remember one time I went to preach at a, a country church, and I was the first person there. I wanted to be early, and I got there early, and I turned my lights off on my car, and it was dark. There wasn't a light anywhere. But you go to most of the world, and at night, it's dark, just naturally speaking, okay? So they lived in the dark. They were in the fields where their flocks, but unto them in that darkness, a Savior was born, revealed to everyday people. Now listen, when we think about Christmas, we think about light. We think about, I mean, we got Christmas lights there. I mean, I got Christmas lights in my house all over the place. And, uh, and, we, and so we, we've got light and we think about light. But the truth is the birth story of Jesus came in a place in a time of great darkness. I mean, when they were talking about, hey, I got good news for you. I got joy for you. Well, if you lived in their world, you'd say, well, I don't see it where I, you know, this world's, it's a mess. I mean, it's, we, we, we got problems. Isaiah, anticipating the, the birth of Christ centuries later, uh, even before Mary, you know, way before Mary was, was with child, Isaiah wrote about the light that was coming into the world. And it came to a people shrouded in darkness. In fact, the words that were used for the era were gloom, anguish, and contempt. Those are the adjectives that were used for the darkness. That's what Jesus was born in. He was not born in a great place. He was not born in a great society. He was born in a place of darkness, deep darkness. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 and 2 says it this way. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed as when the, at first he lightly esteemed the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali. Listen, those lands are the same lands where Jesus was born. Okay, that's what he's talking about here. He said, you're not going to have that kind of gloom. The oppression that, that was there. Listen to this. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So there's darkness here. There's gloom. There's despair. It's a life that you even thought about, should you bring a child into this? That's the life of the world at that time. But Isaiah 9, 6 says, Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Right in the middle of all of that, God picked the dark, the gloom, the, the, the oppression, of life and said in the midst of this I'm going to bring light 
In the midst of it, I'm going to bring light. It brought joy to certain people. It brought joy to Mary when she, when she understood. It brought joy to Elizabeth when she found out about Mary. It brought joy into the lives of these shepherds. And you need to listen to me carefully today, okay? Because you need to understand who you are and where you live. Okay, in order to understand the full revelation of the light which came when Jesus was born, you need to recognize the darkness that was there. Let me give you a few examples, all right? I know this might kind of be, be discouraging, but listen to me. First of all, listen to this. When Christ was born, the word of God had not been heard for 400 years. There was no fresh word from God. There was no anointing from God. There was no presence of God. There was nothing for 400 years. All they had was what Malachi said at the last, uh, there's going to be someone who comes before him to prepare the way for him. That was it. That was the last words of the prophets that were spoken. The very last thing that Elijah would come, but first. And we know John the Baptist fulfilled that. But other than that, God was silent. Listen to that one, one Jewish writer of the day, okay, during this time wrote this. I, I like this. He said, after the latter prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi had died, the Holy Spirit departed from Israel. <laughs> there, was no, there was nothing. There was nothing. It was gone. So everybody walked in spiritual darkness. It's interesting to me, John 1, 14, it's interesting that the Bible says this. It says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh. Now, what do you mean by that? It means it will never, ever leave again. Amen. There will never, ever be silence again. Why? Because Jesus was made flesh. He became the living Word. We will never, ever be without the Word of God again. So the next time you get into some gloom and despair and agony on me, open your Bible. It's a living, breathing testament to you and for you. The second thing is that the people of God and really the whole world at the time were under the oppressive rule of the Roman Empire. Now, I could tell you, listen, uh, go read. There's a, there's a little book about this big, well maybe this, well, maybe this big. It's called The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. Yeah. Uh, the brutality, the, the, the political scheme, the whole, the whole atmosphere, the wars and all the things that, 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 that were involved in living in this time were beyond what our comprehension. In fact, if you lived in Stalin's communist, you were better off than living unless you were part of the elite. So there was this oppression there. I mean, at the snap of his finger, Caesar Augustus said, I want everybody in the world to go back to their hometown. And you know what? They did. Didn't matter how inconvenient it was. Didn't matter whether you had the money to get there or not. Didn't matter what kind of a situation, whether you were pregnant or not. You do it. Total oppression. Now, I know some of us are saying, I tell you, I'm wearing this mask. I'm oppressed. Well, I don't like wearing them either. Okay? But I want to tell you something. 
You better pay attention to who you really are. Okay. Okay. Just listen to what I'm saying. Okay. So, so right in the midst of this, even, <laughs> even though the children of Israel were in Israel, they were being dominated by Rome. Herod uh, was, the, was the king as Jesus was born. Uh, soldiers walked the streets, policing everybody, stopping everybody, questioning everybody, wanting money from everybody. Herod was so paranoid about his own position and power that he killed multiple members of his own family, his own wife, his own kids. Executed them. When the wise men came, you know the story. He wanted Jesus, but he didn't want him for the same reason that the wise men did. He wanted to kill him. How do you know? Because when he didn't find him, he killed everybody else. He killed all the other babies. When he didn't find Jesus, we're still doing that today. We're still executing babies. This is, the, this is one of the, when I, when I studied this, this is one of the things it said about Rome. There was political darkness and it reigned over everybody. Everybody. Political darkness, and it reigned over everybody. That's, that's where Jesus came. The political system, he came. If you weren't a Roman citizen, you had no rights. None. Zero. And even if you did have rights, it may not get you very far if you didn't know the right people. Political darkness in the whole world. At that time. Then you've got God's group. The children of Israel. You got God's group. The problem was that every, all four of these factions in God's group kept fighting against each other. You, you had the Pharisees. Since they didn't have a word from God in 400 years, they made up their own. They made up their own system. They made up their own, own things that you worship this and you do this and you do all these traditions and you do all these things. Jesus, he, he got on them bad when he came. You know that, right? If you read the Bible, Jesus, he, he, he ripped them. Because what they were doing, it wasn't the word of God. It was just tradition. And he, he basically said, your tradition is going to make God's word of no effect in your life. Then you got another group called the Sadducees. <laughs> First time I heard this was Dr. Lester Sumrall. They didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were called the Sadducees. <laughs> they, they, they didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They, 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 were a, they were opposed to the legalism. Well, I'm not doing that. Well, I don't have to do that. Well, I don't have to do that. Sounds like most of the church today. They didn't believe in anything supernatural what, at all. They rejected the supernatural. They had explanation for everything. They're, they're, they're one of the contenders. Then you've got another group called the Essens. You don't hear much about the Essens because they weren't in... Uh, Jerusalem specifically, they, they were in an uh, area of the Dead Sea. In fact, it's where we get found the Dead Sea scrolls that they wrote them. Okay? This group separated themselves from everybody. Now, uh, from, from what we know from history, they were godly people. But they separated themselves from everybody else. And you know what their one prayer was? God, get rid of Rome. God, get rid of Rome. So you've got this group, and, 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 that, and, that, and that's, what, that's what they're doing, praying for the overthrow of Rome. I'm going to talk about this New Year's Eve, but the Lord specifically warned me about separating yourselves away from the world. I'm going to talk to you about it 
New Year's Eve. And then you've got the fourth group, okay? These were the zealots. They were a bands of brothers, not physical brothers, but brothers in ideas. And they did not pray for change. They sought change by violence, by trying to overthrow the government. That's a religious bunch that Jesus came right in the midst of. Jesus worked miracles in the middle of them. Jesus did his work right in the midst of all of that. So there was constant friction. Constant friction. Here's some of the common things that took place during that time. There were riots all the time. Riots were common. Tensions were unceasing. There was always tensions. Darkness permeated Judaism. And there was no unity of the faith. Glory to God in the highest. Are y'all still here? I mean, right in the middle of all that darkness, right in the middle of all that, guess what? Jesus comes. He did not affect that darkness. He changed the darkness to light. Because it still was the same darkness when he was raised from the dead as it was when he was born in the world. But something different happened. Something changed. Something changed. The shepherds really kind of revealed the state of man when the supernatural appeared. First thing was they were afraid. They were scared. But the angels brought peace and calm to them. And all of a sudden, in the midst of that darkness, they were ready to accept the message and the messenger. They were ready to accept it. Now listen to this, okay? They had lived their lives managing the fact that they were living in darkness. Do you know how many people live their lives managing the darkness? Instead of living in the light, they, they just manage their darkness. And, and really, in the past, especially in America, we've been able to do that. But I'm telling you, though, those days are fixing to be over. It's going to either be light or darkness. You can't manage your darkness and, and, and kind of be good and live in darkness. And I'm getting ahead of myself. They learn to manage their darkness until that day that they found out that there was a Savior, that there was a Savior, there was a Messiah, there was a Christ. They managed their, the fact that they were living in darkness, and now a way out of that life they were living appeared to them. Really naturally and spiritually. They were living in the darkness of the night, but they were also living in the darkness of the world. They'd grown accustomed to the darkness until the light appeared. And when the light appeared and brought them a Savior to deliver them from the darkness, all of a sudden they could see something. Now that sounds so simple, but so many Christians today are managing the darkness, they're not living in the light. They get around dark people, they'd be like dark people. They get around light people, they're around light people. They know how to manage. <clears throat> Not going to be able to do that anymore. Not going to be able to do that anymore. Because that darkness is just like a vortex. It'll just suck you in. You can't live your life like that. You can't live your life like that. Here's the most amazing thing about one of the most amazing things about this with the shepherds. Immediately, 
They wanted to go and tell what they had seen. Immediately, they wanted to go and tell what they'd seen. They had a new focus to their lives. They were transformed by the good news. They weren't born again. They just had the good news. Joy began to flow through them in the midst of that darkness. See, listen, all of us at one time were controlled by the darkness. The Bible teaches that over in Ephesians. I'm not going to read it, but it talks about the fact that, that we were all controlled by the darkness. But listen to, what the, listen to this. John chapter 1, verse 4 says this. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. The light shines in the darkness. The light shines in the darkness. It doesn't cooperate with the darkness. It doesn't agree with the darkness. It doesn't walk side by side. It shines into the darkness. And it says, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now, I don't know why they translated that that way, because it literally says in the Greek text that the darkness could not overcome it. The moment that light shined at the birth of Jesus, the moment that light shined, it was never going to be dispelled. Every enemy of darkness has tried to dispel the light, which is the life of Jesus. But it can't do it. Can't do it. Cannot do it. All it can do is get you to cooperate with the darkness instead of the light. Too many people have grown accustomed to darkness, manage their lives by the darkness. But a Savior came to deliver us out of that darkness, and His life was the light. And you've got to make up your mind, how am I going to live my life? Because I want to tell you something. Listen, what I read to you about when Jesus came, it's not going to get any better in the world. You, if you think you're going to be one of the Essens, and you're going to pray for this president to come or this president to come and, and you're going to change everything by, listen to me. Maybe you're one of those who just like the, uh, like the, the Pharisees. Well, I go to church and I do my part. I pay my tithes. And, well, what do you do during the week? Maybe you like the Sadducees. Well, I'm not going to be me. Yeah, that's just the law. You're just trying to bind me, bind me up. No, I'm trying to give you life. Please don't be a zealot. Please don't take your Christianity and mix it with your patriotism and call your patriotism Christianity. Listen, there's nothing wrong with being a patriot. Absolutely, I am proud of my country. And I'm going to stand for, and there I have, certain, I have certain things in me about my nation that I believe, and I'm not going to back off of it, and I'm not going to back down from it. But listen to me. I am not going to, I am not going to co-mingle that with who I am in Christ. Because my cause, I'm just talking about me now, my cause is the cause of Christ. Because that's eternal. That's eternal. So my light is going to shine. I, I'm just saying this because I'm believing this, okay? To the world, not to a segment of the world. Because what, what is my message? A Savior has come to you. Savior has come to you. So you can't get caught up. And, and think, you know, well, well, this is a good cause. Listen, 
There are a lot of good causes. Nothing that doesn't mean you can't be a part of a cause, but don't confuse your Christianity with a cause. You, you've got to be careful. You have to be careful. Don't choose what you give your life to. People of darkness can never overpower what you have unless you let them. The darkness of the world can't overcome, overpower what you have because it's on the inside of you. It's in you. People of darkness can't overpower it. I like the Amplified Bible. It says, the light shines on in the darkness for the darkness has never overpowered it. Put it out or absorbed it or appropriated it and is unreceptive to it. I like that last part. No matter how people mock the light that's in you, no matter how much they mock how you live your life as a child of God and how you live your life, I want to tell you something. Listen to me. It doesn't change the fact that in a moment's time they won't be receptive to that same light that they mocked. I've had it happen hundreds of times in my life where I've had someone mocking me one moment and the next weeping and asking for Jesus to come into their lives. But see, if you don't get, if you're not careful, you can get confused about the light. Unto us is born a savior, a deliverer. He's come to us. We were all part of that world. We were under the sway and the tendencies of the age. We conducted ourselves by the darkness that was around us. Titus 3.3 3 says this, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy and hate in our hearts. We were all like that. Till Jesus came and shined light once Jesus came, all of a sudden, light came. Light that, listen to me, light that had never shone since Adam and Eve transgressed in the garden. All the glories of the Old Testament. Man, there's some powerful things that happened in the Old Testament. I mean, the, the glory of God came and filled the temple to where the priest couldn't even stand. That's nothing compared to the glory of of our Savior and the light and the life that He brought to us. So don't get confused. Don't get confused. Listen to what Jesus said. I'm going to read this scripture and then I'm going to come back and talk about each, these verses. Listen to this. John chapter 3 beginning in verse 16. Any of you ever heard that verse before? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now it's important that you understand that Jesus is the one who said that. That's in red letters, so to speak. That Jesus is the one who said that. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that through him, the world might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. All right, here it is. You ready? Light and darkness. Very simple. Here's the condemnation. Now listen to this. That light has come into the world... And men loved darkness rather than light. Lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done by God. Jesus' whole desire was for the whole world to be saved. God's not willing that any should perish. See, we, we, we have this theology, it's called the sovereignty of God. Well, whatever will be, will be. Well, you know, you know God's going to work it out. Well, you know, well, listen, that's just not true. The end is going to come out just like God said. 
But God has given every person a will to choose. That what, that's what makes you close to God is because you have a right to choose. You have a right to choose. And Jesus, he, he has no desire for you to be lost. He has no desire for you to be commingled with darkness. And he plainly says and very clearly says that it's our responsibility to come out in the light, walk in the light, live in the light. So the world is one thing, but unto us a Savior is born. Somebody to deliver us out of the darkness. Listen, I lived in the darkness and I've lived in the life for 40 some odd years now. The light is so much better. The light is so much better than the darkness. The darkness, oh my Lord, I think about those, those times and think about that life and, and think about the life that I can live in Christ and, and, and the life that he's given me and I think, oh my Lord, why? How, how come the whole world can't just grab this and it, 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 would, it would transform the world if everybody could just hear. But there's an enemy out there and he blinds the minds. He tries to hide the, the light, tries to mock the light. And we don't, we, listen, to be honest with you, sometimes we help him out. We shouldn't. Listen to what it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message that we have heard from him. John's writing directly from what he heard from Jesus. And we declare it to you. So what he got, he got from Jesus. All right, listen. That God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. In him, there's no darkness at all. All right, now listen to this very carefully. If we say... We have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. Apparently that was going on when John wrote this. People were saying they had fellowship with God, but they were walking in darkness. Now listen to this. We lie. And do not practice the truth. Do not practice the truth. But, I love this, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Cleanses us from all sin. It's all about the light. It's all about the darkness. It, you, you've got to decide, where am I going to live my life? Because listen to me, that light that came that fateful day, born unto us as a Savior, came in the midst of darkness. And I want to tell you, his birth did not transform that darkness. Jesus lived out his life under the Roman Empire, under those same four religious groups. Died on the cross, a Roman death of crucifixion. Didn't change it one bit. Even his disciples, Peter was crucified. The history tells us Peter was crucified and he asked to be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be crucified the same way that Jesus was. Nothing changed naturally. You read the history of Paul. Paul ended up going before Caesar as a, as a, as a prisoner. But something did change. 
Light came. Light came. And you and I have to make up our minds, we're going to live in the light and we're going to be the light. Jesus told us that. That we're responsible to be the light. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and, and do what? Glorify God. That's who we are. That's how we live. No matter what's going on in our, in our world, no matter how bad it gets or how bad we think it gets or all our opinions about all of these things in, in the world, listen to me, don't lose sight of the light that's in you, the life that's in you, the joy unspeakable and full of glory that should dwell in you and rise up out of you. Because unto you, a Savior was born, a Redeemer, a Deliverer was born. And now it's our responsibility to walk in that light, to live that life no matter what. Don't get trapped. Don't get trapped. And listen, if you're getting mad at me because I may have touched on something that you think is political or something you think is religious, and I want to tell you something. You need to be careful. I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I'm trying to warn you. This is how we live. This is how we live. Jesus' lifestyle might have given you a clue about how, listen to me, about how he lived on the earth, how we ought to live on the earth. He didn't lead a rebellion. He didn't lead a rebellion. Hallelujah. Bow your heads with me, please, if you would. I'm going to just take a moment here and, and talk to you about something real quickly. Because, you know, all I can do is tell you what the Scripture says. And, and you have to know from that what what you're to do and how you're to respond but if you say you're in fellowship with God and you walk in darkness you're not in a good place and, and look I don't have to explain darkness to you you know what it is and you've got to come out of that darkness you've got to live in the light and let your light so shine If you're here today, maybe you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. You're living in darkness. You may be able to manage your darkness and do pretty good, but here's the thing. Without the life of God in you, you'll not be able to manage that darkness for long. It'll overwhelm you. But when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, light, life comes into you and everything changes. Maybe you're here today and you've been walking in darkness. Maybe you had fellowship with the Lord and you've slipped over and you've gotten over where you don't have any business being. Listen to me today. Listen. The great news is that we can confess our sins. God is just and faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us. And you can walk right back in the light where you need to be. So if you're here today, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Maybe you're watching online today. Or you say, Pastor, I've been away from God. I've been walking in darkness, but I want to get things right. If you're here in the sanctuary and that's you, just as an act of your faith, I want you just to lift your hand real quick. You can put it back down. Just lift it up. Put it back down. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Listen. Thank you. Okay. Now listen. We're going to pray this prayer together. Maybe you didn't raise your hand even, but you say, I've got to do right. I've got to do what I'm supposed to do. I've got to walk in the light. I've got to do what God wants me to do, not what, what I want to do. We're going to pray, and we're going to take that first step this morning. So if you would, everyone, just pray this with me. Just say, Father, thank you that you sent a great light, Jesus, your Son, to give us life, to give us life more abundantly. I choose Jesus, my Lord, as my Savior. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins that I might walk freely in the light and in fellowship with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thanks for connecting with us today on the podcast. And you know, we'd love to connect with you in person at one of our campuses in Shreveport, Louisiana, or in Lake Charles, Louisiana. You can get all the information from our website, lifeunited.church.